it couldn't be done. They said it shouldn't be done. I done did it anyway. Welcome to this very, very special episode of Scotty J's Trailer Trash. Actually, Trailer Trash TV now. Um, as you can see behind me, I made it to Vegas. Nobody believed me. There you go. Here's the nays. This is to the naysayers that said I couldn't do it. So what we're going to do this week, like I started last week's show, we're going to start this week's show with uh, just entirely Hitchcock. Uh, we're going to launch right into Shadow of a Doubt from 1943, following that up with Spellbound from 1945, uh, Notorious from 1946, and rounding out this block, The Parodying Case from 1948. So with that said, I'm going to uh, go blow some quarters and uh, we'll be right back. off houses you'd find swine. I don't want you to touch my mother. So go away, I'm warning you. Go away or I'll kill you myself. Hey. Let me go, Uncle Charlie! Let me go! Forget this man. He has plenty to do with the terrifying mystery that causes this glamorous woman to risk her life and reputation in a reckless experiment. A woman who, because of her consuming love for this man, gambles everything to unlock the fearful secret in his heart. What insidious meaning did he read into the markings on a tablecloth? Why, even when he held his sweetheart in his arms, did he gaze in fear at the dark lines of her robe? These are some of the clues in the picture which bears Hollywood's most distinguished mark of quality. I take it this is your first honeymoon? Yes. I mean, it would be if it were. told you not to forget this man. He is Alfred Hitchcock, the famous director whom you are not likely to forget after you see Spellbound.
I'm sorry to intrude on this tender scene. I, uh, I knew her before you did, loved her before you did. I wasn't as lucky as you. It wasn't a hangover you had that day. You were sick then. What is it, dear? What's wrong with you? You're poisoning me. Paradine case. What manner of woman is Mrs. Parody? What is the truth about this woman around whom there raged such a violent storm of conflicting emotions? I intend that the whole world shall see her as I do, as a noble, self-sacrificing human being. I know what I'm talking about. What I say is true. I know her. And I will tell you one thing more. I will tell you about Mrs. Paradine. She's bad, bad to the bone. I do pity her. Who needs pity more than a woman who's sinned? But from Mrs. Paradine's own lips came unchecked confessions of infamy. I ran away with the man. Istanbul, Athens, Cairo. He was much older, of course. Rich, he took advantage of your youth. He was married, respected. I took advantage of him. Okay, now that I'm completely DAB, I realize now why I don't go near those machines normally in the first place. So with that said, um, Shadow of a Doubt from 1943, I'm actually, all these early Hitchcock, this is what uh, Sir Alfred uh, became noted for. He could do a very suspenseful film, a very frightening film, without relying on the splash and the gore, relied on a lot on the mood and the shadows and the music. And uh, there are a few directors that are still trying to do this today, and overall it still works, but nothing to the artistry and the craft of one Alfred Hitchcock. So with that said, we're going to take a break, and uh, we're going to lighten things up a little bit when we come back with probably my favorite slapstick entertainer of modern times, one Jerry Lewis. We'll be right back. everybody and here's Bob Smith well thanks howdy and I want everybody to meet a real good friend of ours Colgate dental cream and brushing your teeth right after eating with Colgate dental cream stops tooth decay best better than any other home method of oral hygiene say do you want to see a movie howdy it's about a happy tooth and there he is howdy walking down the road and here's that bad Mr. Decay sneaking out from behind a tree. Uh-oh. Oh, Mr. Smith, he, he's trying to catch our happy tooth. Oh, run, happy tooth, run. Don't let Decay catch you. A fork in the road. Which way will he go? Oh, he took the cold gateway, Mr. Smith. Hooray for happy tooth. And Mr. Decay is stopped by Colgate. Wham! Colgate lowers the boom on Decay. Brush your teeth with Colgate. Colgate dental cream. It cleans your breath. What a toothpaste. 
Water cleans your teeth. Call me toothpaste. Cleans your breath. Water toothpaste. Water cleans your teeth. That's right. Just as it says in that movie. Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth and helps stop tooth decay. So you always be like Howdy and me and always brush, brush your, your teeth, teeth with, with Colgate, Colgate Dental, Dental Cream. cream. Oh. Hey, Dad, what's the meeting for? This is a cabinet meeting. There's no hunts in the cabinet. <laughs> Yesterday we bought five bottles of catsup. And now this. Well, gentlemen? Well, Dad, you know how we use up the Hunts catsup. It's a good tomato flavor. We can't keep enough on hand. Yeah, Hunts puts over two pounds of firm, ripe tomatoes in every bottle. I know all that. But five bottles of Hunts in one day? I want to know what happened. Uh -huh. I thought I'd keep a little on reserve. Oh, me too. The guy could get left out. But that's only four bottles. Now, oh well, what's one bottle? What do you mean, what's one bottle? Yeah, Dad, where's that last bottle? <laughs> <laughs> Just in case we got snowed in or something. <laughs> uh, meeting adjourned. You know, before we go any further, you know, being in, in Vegas and all, I got to thank the, uh, above all, for the trip here. I got to thank the Stratosphere Hotel for their accommodations and their entire staff. Uh, it's simply been about a total blast coming out here. It's my first trip to Vegas, so it's, it's just a little bit overwhelming. So I seem a little bit more agitated compared to other times on the show. You know, so be it. But um, this is going to be uh, my, uh, my major plug portion of the show. I got to i got to say a big hello and thank you to both Cheryl and Mary out in Bismarck uh, for continuing the support of Trailer Trash TV as we know it. Uh, i got to say hey to, uh, to Jim Lundberg over in Lake Minnetonka and all the other cable systems that are currently carrying Trailer Trash TV. Thanks again for your continued support. By all means, you know, if, if, you've, always, if you've ever had the itch to get involved in television, I, I strongly, highly recommend getting involved in public access. Um, it's, it's far different from, yet strangely, I think it's a better venue than commercial television. A, well, virtually there is no commercials on public access, and B, you get to use this stuff free of charge or a very nominal fee, depending on what cable system you live in, and it's a way for the average Joe to uh, uh, send forth a message that they feel is important enough to share with the general public. So call your local cable access uh, system, get involved. And I can't tell you how much fun it is. So you just have to experience it for yourself. So with that said, we're going to launch into the Jerry Lewis block, the, the last two Jerry Lewis trailers of this season. Um, not necessarily his strongest stuff. We're going to go into Hook, Line, and Sinker from 1969. And we're going to go into uh, Hardly Working, one of his last major feature films from 1981. So with that said, we'll kick into these. And I'll... Uh, Give you my two cents about them when we come back, and they're really, once you see these, they're not really worth a whole lot more than that initial two cents. So with that said, let's kick into these. We'll be right back. You're a contented, beautiful home, lovely wife, two healthy children, a faithful dog, everything a man could ask for. Suddenly, your doctor, who's also your best friend, breaks the news that you have only a few months to live. Jerry Lewis takes the news pretty hard in Hook, Line, and Sinker. Peter Lawford takes it even harder. On the other hand, Jerry's wife, Anne Francis, is positively enthusiastic. Go fishing. I don't mean the half-day boat out of Malibu Pier. I mean real fishing, like you've always wanted. The Caribbean, the Mediterranean. That sounds marvelous, honey, but where am I going to get the money? Where's your wallet? Right here. Casualty, that's where. Diners Club, Carte Blanche, Global Express. You can sign yourself onto any airline. You can go into any hotel, any restaurant. You can buy out the best men's shops. 
You can charter a boat even and hire a crew. The temptation is irresistible. Sure, it's stealing, but they don't put corpses in prison, do they? Oh. Help! Oh. Help me! As the complete angler, you play all the angles and come up with all the curves. You're loaded to the gills. You're determined to be the life of the party, even if it kills you. Then your pal, the doctor, shows up with more bad news. A hundred thousand clams. Now you tell me I'm gonna live. Holy cow, who's gonna pay all these bills? I had this glimmer of a notion. Well, try me. I mean, I'll do anything. I have no choice. No, it's too big a sacrifice. Just say what you're gonna say. Let me make the decision. Very simply, your problem would be over if you were to die. You were right. It's too big a sacrifice. There's only one way to get out of this alive. How? You'll never guess. You'll find out when Jerry lands the biggest fun catch of them all. Watch out, America! Jerry's back! The world's funniest funny man has something to say about inflation and unemployment for all us working stiffs. He's the original jerk. Bumbling and stumbling. It's Jerry Lewis in his first new motion picture in a long time. Oh, I like that. Hardly working. More fun than a day off. Okay, so as you saw, between hook, line, and sinker and hardly working, not really worth the celluloid that they were printed on. Um, it, he tried to introduce the same slapstick that he was known for to a new audience, and for lack of a better phrase, it went over like a fart in church. So with that said, um, we're going to take a break, but i got to do another shameless plug. Uh, let me know what you think of the show. No uncertain terms. If you like it, you hate it. Um, SJ Trailer Trash at Yahoo.com. Uh, please email me with any and all comments, positive, negative, whatever. I don't care if you hate the show. That still tells me you're watching the show. Any publicity is good publicity. <laughs> so therefore, oh, check out the website as well. Uh, very informative. Not a lot of bells and whistles, but it's got a lot of links. It's uh, www.trailertrashtv.150m.com. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So with that said, we're going to kick in the break here. And uh, we'll be right back with the, uh, well, my boat rocker portion of the show, the non-PC cartoons. been eating Kellogg's Corn Flakes for a long time. Haven't we all? Yeah, but why ain't she told up yet? Well, Jethro, Kellogg's Corn Flakes don't act on girls the same way they do boys. They don't, uh, tall up. They kind of, um... <laughs> Girl up. Girl up? Yeah. Eat your Corn Flakes. <laughs> one used it as a seasoning in cooking. A1 has 13 seasonings in it. 13! 13! A1 adds enormous flavor. Shake some in the stew, Igor. Stew! Stew! Shake some on the meatballs, Beverly. You can use it to season salads, fish, and fowl. A1 is for sauce that's a seasoning. 13 seasonings. Experiment with it. Shot. 
I've made better. Want to play? I came to play Wisconsin Skinny. That's me. You a hustler? Nope, salesman. Break. Salesman, huh? What do you sell? Skittle pull. Skittle pull by Aurora. It's a lot of fun. Gladys, I don't see any point in you taking French lessons. It'll just be money down the drain. It will not be wasted. French is such an expressive language. It doesn't compare with ours. Oh, may we? Let me demonstrate. <laughs> Voila. Mm. I am not finished. You see, berries in glass, topped with whipped orange fruit juice topping. And it is very easy to make with Carnation Instant Non-Fat Dry Milk because the recipe for whipped fruit juice topping is on the Carnation Instant label. Of course, you can use any chilled fruit juice. Then you add Carnation's magic crystals and whip. Add lemon juice and whip again into luscious whipped topping for a real fruit flavor. This is one thing you just can't do with whipping cream. And whipped Carnation Instant has two-thirds less calories than whipped cream. And it costs only two and a half cents a serving. You lost your accent, Gladys. Oh, it is a merveilleux way to add color to desserts with whipped carnation instant fruit juice topping. N'est-ce pas? C'est magnifique. And may I honor you, madame, with a typical French reward. May we? Oui, merci, merci. <laughs> You're right, it doesn't compare with the American way. What I tell you? <laughs> Trash TV. I'm still your host, Scotty J. Live from Las Vegas this time around, as well as the rest of the Trail of Trash season this year. Um, we're actually about 14 stories up at the Stratosphere in Las Vegas, just off the Strip, and uh, we're having a blast. You know, I've done run all my uh, quarter allotment out, so it's come to this, and you're watching the results. Therefore, we're going to kick into my uh, boat rocker portion of the show, the non-PC cartoons. We've been getting a surprisingly favorable response as of late. I was a little concerned when I started airing these, but evidently there's a lot of people out there who feel the same way. You know, the people that are hung up on being politically correct need to get over themselves, like I've stated before, and uh, lighten the hell up. Anyway, this time around we got something called Molly Moo Cow, Molly Moo Cow and the Indians. Uh, we'll say late 30s, early 40s era, but uh, I think you'll strangely enjoy this. I found it rather amusing and you know I gotta stick the disclaimer in there for these particular short films themselves they they do not reflect my opinions nor those of the station that you're watching this on. This is what the producers of the time wanted to convey. They thought it was amusing. Um, some of them were rather callous in the presentation but um, you look at them now and I honestly think they're so over the top they're they're laughable now and take them for what they are and it's it's basically another piece of cinematic celluloid history so with that said here's Molly Mukau and Indians um, and with that we'll be back with the probably the most widely followed segment of Trailer Trash TV in recent years the classroom classic stay tuned
sure love your dress, Elaine. Isn't it nice they're finally putting some style into larger sizes? Time to get back into things? Eat smart at every meal, starting with breakfast. Kellogg's Special K breakfast is only 240 calories, 99% fat-free. And delicious Special K is loaded with protein. Let the Special K breakfast help you get back into things. Elaine, you look marvelous in that suit. Let's go, Tom. Tom! Bloodstains virtually gone, gone, gone. Jane gets everything unbelievably clean. That's hard to believe. Your stains come clean, but these stains were set in Harold's shirt yesterday. Jane will get them out. When Harold gets stains, they never come out. Well, let's see those stains. All right, Harold. Hamburger, chocolate ice cream. Grass and mud. They're in the stay. Jane can't get those out. Sure it can. Jane's not a conventional detergent. Look at the box. Microenzyme action. Gain treats stains like dirt. You see, stains are locked into fabric fibers, but Gain's enzymes act like little keys to unlock stains. Where are the stains? Grass and mud stains, chocolate ice cream, hamburger. Virtually gone, gone, gone. That's... that's... Unbelievable? Yes. Everything's unbelievably clean with the unbelievable detergent. Gain treats stains like dirt. Hi, new neighbors. Need a hand? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Dandruff. Dandruff. Yeah. He is cute, except <laughs> for, for his dandruff. That's ugly. It's that bad? So Roger started using head and shoulders regularly. It helped solve his dandruff problem. Made his hair look great. And what a good neighbor policy that started. Nice hair. Head and shoulders. For people who don't worry about dandruff, but ought to. Once again, welcome back to Trailer Trash TV. I'm your host, Scotty J. And I have to thank, above all, I, I said this at the beginning of the show, I got to thank the, the entire staff and management of the Stratosphere Hotel for uh, letting me, uh, letting me go, as it were. <laughs> um, I'm uh, kind of shooting some of the initial segments here. You're going to see some other stuff from in and around Vegas uh, as the rest of the season progresses. But, uh, um, if you ever, ever, ever get the chance to come out here, you don't need to be a gambler. You can have lots of free fun. You can have lots of family-related fun. You don't got to be a gambler to do Vegas. And uh, with that said, we're going to launch into the Classroom Classic this time around. And uh, this one's going to get me in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> I'm assuming. Maybe it won't. And I'm laughing because it shouldn't. This was shown in virtually every health class from the year it came out to present day. Um, it's a classic Cornette film. Uh, and the title says it all. I don't really need to explain anything. It's called Human Reproduction. And yeah, it mentions the, the names of the male and female parts accordingly. And, you know, if, if you're a kid watching this, pay attention to this. And after watching this, go to your parents and ask them why they never told you about this stuff. And if your parents are that uptight about uh, this type of stuff, well, this is reality. How do you think you got on this planet? So with that said, I'm going to close out this edition of Trailer Trash TV, and uh, we'll see you later on on the strip. John Burke, class of 1940. This is Mary Burke, class of 1940. This is John Burke, Jr., class of 1966, according to the fond hopes of his parents. Someday, you may be in John Burke's shoes, or in Mary Burke's high-heeled slippers. What are you going to do or say.
when something like this takes place in your own household. Mary, I forgot to tell you, Jim wasn't at the office today. He took Helen to the hospital. Oh, that's big. I guess they're both pretty excited. Do you think I should telephone the hospital? Well, Jim will call as soon as the baby is born. I don't know which of them will be satisfied. I know Helen has a heart set on a girl. And I know Jim has his heart set on a boy. I can't wait. I'm going to telephone the hospital now. Dad, how can Aunt Helen and Uncle Jim have a baby if they don't know what they want? No, it doesn't matter, Johnny. They'll love their little baby whether it's a boy or a girl. Dad? Yes? Where do babies come from, anyhow? Why, mothers bring them into the world. But why do mothers bring them? Johnny, by the grace of heaven, mothers are the only ones who know how to bring babies into the world. That's right, Dad. Mothers do bring babies into the world. But sooner than you may think now, your child will be old enough for a full explanation. So let's brush up on it you and I, and together review the human reproductive system. A model will help you review the fundamentals. The female sex organs, as seen from outside, consist of several folds of skin or tissue called the labia or lips. These labia cover the urethra through which urine is passed and the entrance to the vagina. Cutting through this model, these organs can be seen as they actually appear in vertical section through the midline. Here is the vagina. The vagina has a moist lining called the mucous membrane. Its walls lie in folds, which can be easily stretched. A membrane partly covers the entrance to the vagina. This is the hymen, or maidenhead. Its absence does not mean lack of virginity since it may be accidentally broken during childhood. The uterus, shown here in a front view, is a small pear-shaped organ, normally only about half the size of a fist. Below it is the vagina. And connected to it at the top are two tubes, the fallopian tubes, and the two ovaries. In a section through these organs, we can see the cervix. This is the narrow neck of the uterus, and it extends into the vagina. The walls of the uterus are very thick, but may be stretched so that the uterus can enlarge to many times its original size during pregnancy. One end of the fallopian tube is open so that eggs, or ova, from the adjacent ovary may easily enter and be carried to the uterus. The ovary is a gland in which eggs are constantly being formed. Each almond-shaped ovary is about an inch and a half in length. Besides producing eggs, these glands secrete fluids into the blood which are responsible for the development of female characteristics in other parts of the body, such as breasts, hair, and skin. But from puberty on, the primary function of the ovaries is the production of eggs. In a closer view, we can watch the development of an egg. Remember that while this one is growing, all the others are growing also. But usually, only one egg reaches maturity every 28 days. After reaching full development, it breaks through the ovarian wall and passes into the fallopian tube. This breaking through of the egg is called ovulation. The fully developed egg is only one two hundredth of an inch in diameter. When mature, each egg is capable, if fertilized, of developing into a baby. Moreover, each egg carries all of the hereditary characteristics of the mother. Since the function of the uterus 
is primarily that of receiving the fertilized egg and nourishing the developing child, the walls undergo a regular cycle of preparation for this job. The lining of the uterus becomes soft and spongy and engorged with blood and fluids. This progresses during the final stages of the development of the egg, its extrusion from the ovary and its passage through the tube. If fertilization of the egg does not occur, the uterine wall lining breaks down and is discharged from the body as the menstrual flow. If we call this onset of menstruation the first day of the menstrual cycle, we can watch the various elements as they recur during each 28-day period. After the menstrual flow stops, about the fourth day, the uterine lining begins to build up again. Meanwhile, eggs are being formed in the ovaries. In the normal cycle, ovulation occurs about the 14th day, and an egg is extruded into the fallopian tube. It starts its slow passage toward the uterus, but if not fertilized, it dissolves away or disappears in the tube. After the 28th day, menstruation occurs again, and the cycle is repeated. This then is the structure and function of the female reproductive organs. The ovaries which every 28 days discharge mature eggs into the fallopian tubes. The uterus, which during the same period gets ready to receive the egg in case it is fertilized by contact with the male sperm. If fertilization of the egg does not occur, the egg itself dissolves or disappears and the uterine wall linings now deprived of their special function to nourish the developing child, break down and are discharged as the menstrual flow. Although the average menstrual cycle usually occurs every 28 days, in many cases it may be somewhat longer or shorter. Because it depends on the proper functioning of many glands, its normal time schedule may be easily upset by nervous strain, emotion or illness. The process is regularly repeated, however, every 28 days, unless fertilization of the egg occurs and pregnancy begins. These are the facts of the female reproductive system. This is the information which you, Dad, should clearly understand before you can pass on correct knowledge to your child when he is old enough to understand. Daddy? Yes? Why do babies have fathers? Oh, well, there wouldn't be any babies without fathers. But why? Well, your child is inquisitive. One day you'll have to tell him why babies do have fathers. And that brings us to the next chapter in our review of the story of reproduction. The structure and function of the male reproductive organs. The external male reproductive organs, as shown in this drawing, consist of the penis and the scrotum. The scrotum contains the testicles. In a section view, we can see that the penis and testicles are connected by a long tube. This is the urethral canal. It extends from the penis back past the prostate gland and seminal vesicles to join the tube leading from the testicles. In this same diagram, we can see also the bladder which empties into the urethral canal. The testicles in men correspond to the ovaries in women because they both are glands in which the reproductive elements are formed. If we examine a section of the testicle, we find that it is composed of small compartments filled with two kinds of cells. One kind produces an internal secretion which is carried in the blood and results in the development of male characteristics, such as skin, beard, voice, and body structure. The second, or lining cells, are constantly being changed into spermatozoa. Spermatozoa are the male sex cells. These spermatozoa, or sperm cells, are microscopic single cells, which are propelled by the lashing motion of their long tails. 
like the ovum or egg of the female, each sperm cell contains all the hereditary characteristics which are passed from the father to the child. Spermatozoa are constantly being formed in the testicles and are stored in the mass of curled tubes seen here. If not emptied during sexual intercourse, they are periodically emptied during sleep in nocturnal emissions or wet dreams. Wet dreams are a perfectly normal body function, which is nature's way of getting rid of stored up sperm. Therefore, the common belief that intercourse or masturbation are necessary to relieve the pressure of stored up sperm is absolutely not true. Millions of spermatozoa are stored, ready for ejaculation. During intercourse, the penis is in a state of erection. This is caused by the spongy tissues of the penis becoming engorged with blood. The sperm passes up through the ducts where fluids from the glands are added to form the semen. The semen then flows through the urethral canal and is deposited into the female vagina. We return now to the female organs with the egg slowly moving through the tube. Male sperm are deposited at the upper end of the vagina near the cervix. They begin moving up into the uterus. Sperm may remain active here for several days. The sperm move into the tubes and approach the egg. In this diagram, both the egg and the spermatozoa are greatly enlarged in proportion to the size of the organs shown. Normally, fertilization takes place while the egg is in the tube. Here, we can see this fertilization in closer view. After one spermatozoan enters the egg, no others enter. The tail drops off. The nuclei of sperm and egg merge and the development begins. The fertilized egg develops by first splitting into two, then into four, eight, and so on. From this fusion of a single egg and a single spermatozoan, the child develops. These early divisions take place while the fertilized egg is still moving through the tube. As you may recall, the uterine wall has, during this part of the menstrual cycle, been preparing to receive this egg. The wall is rich with blood and lymph from which the growing organism will draw its nourishment. Nesting of the egg against the uterine wall brings about many glandular actions. These first cause a cessation of menstruation, and then, during the course of the egg's development into a baby, produce the many secondary physical and physiological characteristics of pregnancy. After the first two weeks, this fertilized egg enters the embryo stage. The embryo itself lies along the inner margin of the yolk sac and is in turn connected by a stalk to the membrane through which food will be absorbed. At this time, the embryo is still almost microscopic in size, but the largest portion is the yolk sac which provides early nourishment. The development of the embryo is an interesting and highly complex process. During the first four weeks, the embryo increases rapidly in size. The yolk sac becomes progressively smaller as it is absorbed but the mechanism for feeding from the mother has in the meantime been developed. At the fourth week, buds have appeared where the limbs will develop, and the embryo has now taken definite form. During the next month, the limbs assume more specific shape, and the head becomes large as the brain develops. The fetus, as it is now called, resembles most other mammals at a similar stage of growth. During the third and fourth months, the fetus develops all the human facial characteristics, the fingers and toes and the external sex organs. At the end of the fourth month, the fetus averages about six inches in length and its heartbeat may be heard for the first time. Development from this point on 
is that of extensive growth and refinement of individual organs and tissues. Within the uterus, the child usually occupies this position. Here is the umbilical cord, which passes from the child to the placenta, commonly called the afterbirth. It is through this cord and placenta that nourishment is carried to the growing fetus from the first month to the day of its birth. In a closer view of this mechanism, we see that no direct connection exists between the circulatory system of the mother and that of the child. Food is carried in the mother's blood to the uterine wall. The placenta carries the bloodstream of the child to close contact with the uterine wall. By osmosis, food is carried across the spongy tissue from the mother to the child, while wastes from the child are similarly passed across to the bloodstream of the mother. This is the only contact between mother and child. There is no common bloodstream as is frequently thought. As a matter of fact, all of the child's blood was formed within its own developing body. At full term, nine months, the child has reached an average length of about 18 inches and an average weight of about six to eight pounds. At this stage, the child is a completely developed living organism. The better you understand all of these facts, the better you will be prepared to discharge one of the greatest responsibilities of parenthood, the intelligent education of your child to the facts of human reproduction. Daddy, why did Aunt Helen have to go to the hospital to have a baby? Well, today most babies are born in hospitals. Are they sick when they're born? No, but mothers, in bringing babies into the world need careful attention and the hospital is the best place for that. Right, Dad. But you also know that an expectant mother requires medical attention from the very beginning of pregnancy because from this time on, marked physical changes take place in her body. Here we see first the normal female figure showing the uterus and vagina. As pregnancy continues, the uterus becomes more distended with corresponding changes in body contour. The stomach, intestines, liver, and other organs are pushed out of normal position. Posture is changed. You can also see the enlargement of the breasts in preparation for feeding the infant. Yet, as marked as these physical changes appear, they are only temporary. Shortly after childbirth, most of them will disappear. Here, in a closer view, we see the fully developed child just before birth, in the usual position for delivery. Here is the uterus, greatly extended, the cervix still unopened, the vagina, and the pelvic girdle formed by the hip bones through which the child will pass. All but the pelvic girdle are tissues which can easily stretch. During previous examinations, the physician has informed himself of the position of the child and the size of the pelvis. And now he awaits the expected body action. This begins with rhythmic contractions of the uterus. These contractions start at long intervals, but gradually become frequent. The greatest contractions occur at the upper end of the uterus, so that the pressure is directed toward the cervix. As the contractions become even more frequent, the cervix opens. The vagina stretches to permit passage of the child. And aided by contractions of the abdominal muscles, the child is brought into the world in a normal manner. This, then, is the story of reproduction, a story which any parent should fully understand, not only to ensure the arrival of a healthy child, but also to cope with the sensitive minds of children, your children, throughout successive stages in their constant search for knowledge. On your answers, 
may well depend the physical and emotional health of future generations. I just phoned the hospital. They've had twin boys. Twins, eh? Well, poor Jim. What do you mean, poor Jim? I'm just thinking of all the questions he's going to have to answer.